Hello everyone, so I hope you're well and still enjoying your lockdown period. Uh, I just thought that we need to cover everything we've done in term one. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the cash flow statement. I'm going to try and do everything as thoroughly as possible to explain everything slowly to you, just going over the basics and let's see how it goes. If you've got any questions, please ask. Right, so this is note one. Uh, reconciliation between net profit before tax and cash generated from operations. So the first amount that you need to fill in is net profit before tax. Okay, straightforward. You get that from your income statement. Then we've got two adjustments. We've got depreciation and interest expense. With those two amounts, you need to go to the income statement and you need to get the amounts and just add them there so they will be two positive amounts then we've got an answer and then we get to the second part so that's part a and this is part b in this part over here we're going to look at our inventories our receivables and our payables all of those information we will get from our balance sheet we are going to compare the two years with each other. So we're going to get the difference between the two years. And we need to write whether it's an increase or a decrease in those three amounts. It's very important that you show me the amounts of a year in a bracket. And then the answer will either be in a bracket or a positive. Now it's very important that when we look at receivables, you may not include SARS income tax as one of the amounts. And when you look at payables, you may not use SARS income tax, shareholders for dividends, or accrued expense if it's interest. Then it must be left out. Right, so you'll see over there I've entered all the amounts for you. Depreciation and interest expense are positives because I'm trying to cancel them out. Depreciation is seen as a non-cash item, so it will not be in my cash flow statement. And interest expense is important. We're going to show it separate. Then over here, if it's an increase in inventories, it means I bought more. Then it's an outflow of money. If it's a decrease of receivables, then it means they paid me. So it's an inflow of money, a positive over there. And then if it's a decrease in payables, it means I paid back the money I owe. It's an outflow of money. Everything inside of the block must be added on top. And then I'm going to say the 907 minus the 9200 will give me the amount at the bottom. Okay. Right, so the cash flow statement itself has four parts. Part one, part two, part three, and the bottom is part four. I'm going to go through each of the four parts separately, and we're going to start with part one. Okay, so this is part one. So you'll see I've got four entries that I need to look at. That's note one. We just covered note one. So I just put the answer in there. Then with interest paid, dividends paid and taxes paid, I've got separate notes. You don't have to do it in my format. It just makes it easier. So over here, I've got interest paid and dividends paid. And you will see these two notes are very similar. You've got the amount from the income statement for interest. That's your interest expense amount. Then a balance at the beginning of the year and a balance at the end of the year. These two amounts might be there or they might not. You will find them in note 9, accrued expense, but they will indicate very clearly that it's interest. If they don't indicate that it's interest, it's not going here. So if it's an accrued expense and they indicate that it's interest, you're going to enter it here, the balance at the beginning of the year and the balance at the end of the year. And then basically you just go from the top down to get an answer. Bracket, bracket, no bracket, and a bracket for your answer. It will always look like that. If we go to dividends, very similar. 
But now you'll find the first amount in the retained income note. It says very clearly dividends, ordinary share dividends. It's the dividends that we paid and declared together. You put it in there. Balance at the beginning of the year, balance at the end of the year. You'll also find it in note nine. It's called shareholders for dividends. Balance at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, and then you just go down, bracket, bracket, no bracket, bracket. And that's it. Okay, so then just to clarify, in there we're going to put the paid and the final dividend. That's the final of last year, and this is the final of the current year. The amounts that are actually paid, actually, is the interim dividend of this year and the final dividend of last year. Now we've got the note on taxes. So the layout looks very similar again. We've got an amount from the income statement. That's your income tax amount. Balance at the beginning of the year, balance at the end of the year. But now it looks different because the balance at the beginning at the end of the year can either be in note five, your debtor's note, or it can be in note nine, your creditor's note. So when we look at debit balances, you'll find it in your debtor's note. And we talk about credit balances, you'll find it in your creditor's note. And now you need to know whether it has a bracket or not. So I like to draw my little T account and this will have to be your little summary that you memorize. If I've got a debit balance, it means I paid too much last year. I don't have to pay now, no bracket. If I've got a, a credit balance at the beginning of the year, it means I paid too little last year. When will I pay? Right now. It will have a bracket. If I've got a debit balance at the end of the year, it means I paid too much this year with the emphasis on I paid bracket. And if I've got a credit balance at the end of the year, it means I paid too little. When will I pay? Only next year. So those two will always have the brackets and these two will always have positives. So then you just enter them over there and then your answer will always be a bracket. Right, this is the second part of the cash flow statement. Cash effects from investing activities. It's very important that you know what falls under investing activities. The purchase of fixed assets, the proceeds from the sale of fixed assets and investments. So purchase of fixed assets will always be in a bracket because it's an outflow of money. I bought something. The proceeds of the fixed assets will be an income or inflow of money for the business. So that will be a positive amount. And it's very important to take note that the proceeds from the sale must be shown there at carrying value. And with investments, you either place an investment, it's an outflow of money, or the investment matured, then it's an inflow of money. And then over here, this is my formula for fixed assets. So it goes carrying value at the beginning of the year, plus your additions, minus depreciation, minus the disposals at carrying value will give you the carrying value at the end of the year. So, for example, if I need to work out the purchase of fixed assets, they might give me everything, but I don't have the additions. Then it literally becomes a mathematical equation and you solve X. Similarly, they can do it with disposals and give you everything else, or they can even do it with depreciation when you need to enter it in note one um, at the start of this cash flow statement. So it's very important to memorize this. Okay. Okay, so they have just entered amounts to show you. It's very important that you do show how you got to the investment one. Investments, again, refers to my fixed deposit. So if it matured, then it means that was last year's amount and then it's the current year. So my investment became less, which means I got 150,000 Rand. And then the 
very important rule, everything inside the block will be entered on top. Okay, the third part is called the financing activities. You need to know that shares and loans are part of my financing activities. Where do I get my money? Over there, I've got the proceeds from the shares issued. So that's very straightforward, the amount of shares and the rand amount per share. With the repurchase of shares, now we are going to look at the amount that we actually paid for the shares, not the average, not the loss, the full amount that I actually paid. And then with my loans, I need to know if it's an increase in my loans or if I repaid my loans. Right, so there I just showed you, um, I issued 350,000 shares at three rand each. That's an inflow of money, a positive. The repurchase amount was 6 Rand and I bought back 50,000 shares, so that's an outflow of money. And if I repay my loan, then the, um, the balance will decrease from last year, which we means I paid 40,000 in this example. And then everything inside the block will be added together and written on top. And then the part over here at the end just shows you the cash and cash equivalence balance at the beginning of the year at the end of the year and then the difference between the two years will give you the net change in cash and cash equivalents. Okay, so sometimes you will have to just make a little side note with the cash and cash equivalents to work it out for yourself. So you will see over here that in my 2019 column bank was an overdraft. It's very important you need to go and look for an overdraft. They will not spell it out for you. They want to catch you out. So it's very important to go and look for an overdraft. So if I add up this column, I get 9,850 in a bracket. This is the amount that I'm going to put in my cash flow statement at the beginning of the year. And then this 23,300 will be the amount that I'm going to enter in my cash flow statement for balance at the end of the year. But then it's also important to work either work out across like that, or in this case, I can just take the totals. Now, it's very important when I go from a negative amount to a positive, 2019 was negative, 2020 was positive. The negative amount is over there. That means now, and I got 23,300. That means I received 9,850 Rand. Then I stand at zero. And then I received another 23,300 Rand. So I received an inflow of money, 33,150 Rand. So it's very important when the one is a negative and the other is a positive, you actually add the two amounts together to get the net and you do not subtract. If it's like that, two positives, I subtract the inflow over there is 150. But over here, because the one is a positive and the other a negative, I need to add them together because I first go to zero and then I add the other 23,300 Rand. And then the last thing I want to show you is over here the balance at the beginning of the year and the balance at the end of the year. The difference between those two will give me my net like I've just explained to you. But then also part one's answer plus part two's answer plus part three's answer will also give you the net amount if you've worked everything correctly.